It's not that they are inappropriate topics for a sacrament meeting, but they are inappropriate if we don't connect them very directly to the Savior himself. It's got to be more along the lines of how does obedience to the law of tithing draw us closer to Jesus Christ? What does participation in family history work teach us about the great vicarious sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ through his atonement? We're very careful to connect every sacrament meeting topic to the Savior himself. And that's because we view sacrament meeting as a meeting that commemorates and recognizes and remembers the Savior and his atoning sacrifice. We go there to make covenants at the sacrament table in commemoration of his atoning sacrifice and everything that happens in that meeting should be focused on him. This is a return guest from a while ago and that's Nate Sharp. How are you? I'm doing well, Kurt. How are you? Good. Now we were just uh, looking up. It was at the end of 2015 that we uh, last had the interview and uh, the title of that was why every ward needs digital ward missionaries. And we talked about this ward blog that your, your ward had created when you were Bishop. And that seems like a lifetime ago. <laughs> it does feel like a lifetime ago. That was, that was a really fun experience doing yeah. that blog and really getting involved in digital missionary work. And it was fun to talk to you. So I'm just excited to be yeah. back with you again. Do you remember, I mean, I didn't listen to it before we recorded, but just the general, because I guess there was this Aggieland Mormons a blog that you created back when we That's could right. use the term Mormon. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I, I guess your your word just created this and it created some cool missionary opportunities. And is that is that blog still going? or? It's not still going. Uh, for one thing, we renamed it to be, uh, you know, obedient to the, the latest <laughs> council. So... But, you know, what happened, I guess what made that experience really special is because we're in a college town and we gather people from sort of all over the place that are part of the church when they live here, we had a broadcast journalism graduate from BYU. We had a graphic designer from BYU. We had someone working in public relations, you know, who these were all members of my ward and we called them all at the same time to join the ward mission as digital missionaries. And we produced this blog. And, and if, I think by the time we took down the blog, the pro challenge was right. That most of them moved away. In fact, now all of them that were involved, except for me, they've all moved away because many of them come here temporarily for school or their spouse is here for school. But we had millions of page views on the blog, several million page views before it was done. And and we hope in a small way, you know, contributed to the positive messaging around the church and, and its mission. And it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And that's, you know, just the nature of, of wards and leadership, you know, some leaders come and go or members come and go and not that yeah. it was a bad idea or it outgrew the, it's worth it just, uh, you know, try different things. So uh, exactly. that, that's the way it goes. So, and then, exactly. uh, I guess a few years after that interview, you were then called as the state president of the area. That's correct. So I was called as stake president in November of 2016, actually. So oh, okay. it was only a year after we did that interview, as a matter of fact, that um, I was called. Gosh, that seems like forever ago, but yeah, it was 2016. <laughs> yeah. Is there a so. story behind that call or was it pretty, pretty typical? Well, I mean, I think it was just a, a really special experience for me. I mean, I guess it was the typical experience with a, when a general authority 70 comes to reorganize a stake presidency, I, because I was serving as a bishop at the time, I was one of, I think several dozen uh, men who, who was interviewed by, we had a visiting general authority 70 and an area 70 who came with him. And so uh, it was a remarkable experience to be, among the the group that was interviewed and then i went home and and planned on doing some yard work and relaxing for the rest of the day and and then a phone call came later that afternoon asking me and my wife to come back to the stake center and, and visit with them and and wow what a weekend it was an amazing experience to say yeah. the least nice and uh, that was about seven years ago then it was about seven years ago nice. so i nice 
not that we're counting, but I guess it's about <laughs> a nine year. I think they say it's a nine year calling now. So we're that's right. Yeah, if you don't count, that somebody at uh, Salt Lake will count for you. So. <laughs> that's right. That's <laughs> yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. Now, obviously, the the name of the old blog was Aggie Land, so uh, that gives away that you're the college town you're in is for uh, is Texas A and M. That's exactly right. So the name of the stake is the College Station, Texas Stake. Mm. And uh, obviously, Texas A&M University is kind of the, the big magnet to this area. And many of the members of our stake either work at Texas A&M or they're graduate students or undergraduate students. We have a, a very strong and active young single adult ward here in our stake that is filled with A&M students. And we yeah. actually, we have a, a community college in the area as well, Blinn College. Um, and I think, you know, Kurt, I've thought before, I think one unique thing about our stake is if you took the number of young single adults or the proportion, I guess, of young single adults to the total population within our stake boundaries, I think it has to be the highest percentage of young single adults among the total population of any stake in the world, other than young single adult stakes, which even there, you know, even if you're at BYU or I guess in Arizona, some of those places where they organize young single adult stakes, it's still the case that those are in very, very highly populated areas. So overall, the proportion of young single yeah. adults to the population is smaller. We've got multiple large schools. Texas A&M is the largest public university in the country. Wow. Uh, we've got over 70,000 students on campus here at, in College Station at Texas A&M. Plus Blinn College, you know, is another 20,000 across its two locations in our stake. We have another A&M campus called the Rellis Campus here. So we've got a very large number of young single adults within our state boundaries. Wow. And so do the neighboring stakes also have YSA wards or, or are you the the main one? Well, we're the largest one in, in the Houston Temple District, the Houston, mm -hmm. Texas Temple District. But there is another young single adult ward that serves. It's kind of an overlay ward that serves across multiple stakes in the Houston area. And there is a, a pretty significant population of young single adults in the greater Houston area. But um, I think our, our young single adult ward is unique just in the sense that everybody's here going to school and there's, there's some that are working as well, but just the energy level of our young single adult ward is, is pretty amazing. Wow. That's awesome. Now, um, so with the, you know, usually the YSA wards or stakes that I deal with are here locally since they are sort of their own stake. And, um, do you, um, with this new emphasis on involving young single adults, has that shifted much or what's that been like in your area? Yeah, that, I think that was a really exciting change for us in this area. So historically, the young single adult ward here, we've had two student wards before in the past when they were, we used to call them student wards, I guess, back, you know, 20 years yeah. ago. That was in the handbook <laughs> even. And often they would call mem members of the elders quorum to serve in the bishopric, but they were not ordained high priests. It was kind of a different structure then. Mm -hmm. Then we rebooted and became a young single adult ward. That happened probably, I'm guessing, about 15 years ago. But we had three, you know, bishopric members, a bishopric and two counselors who were married high priests from other units in our stake who would come in and serve as the bishopric. And even the ward clerk often was a married member of the stake who came in and kind of functioned in that way. And then when the changes were announced, I guess I'm trying to think of the calendar, it was... I think just over a year ago that the letter came out that emphasized that we needed to utilize the young single adults themselves. And so we changed the bishopric at that time. It was the right time to change the bishopric. And now the bishop of the ward is the only married uh, person serving in leadership anywhere in that ward. He's got two young single adult counselors. Um, we have a young single adult ward clerk again. Even the high counselor we called, uh, who was serving the young single adult ward as a member of the high council, 
was a young single adult. He recently got married, so, so he's no <laughs> longer a young single adult. But for a time, even the high counselor was a young single adult uh, serving that ward. And it has really made a tremendously positive difference. I think yeah. the young single adults love that they have so much more influence uh, working together on the ward council. And it's it's been exciting and it's been very positive for us. Oh, that's great. That's really great. Um, now you're also the, uh, you actually work for Texas A&M and you're the Dean of the business school. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So I've been in that role. I'm the Dean. Our business school is called the Mays business school, mm -hmm. uh, named for Lowry Mays, who was an entrepreneur and a businessman, uh, in here in Texas kind of made his career in San Antonio and, uh, a remarkable man. And so I, I started my academic career at, at Mays Business School back in 2007, came here after I finished my graduate work, my PhD at the University of Texas, which is actually one oh, wow. of, uh, kind of our big rival yeah. uh, in, in Austin. <laughs> so it was a, I had to, you know, throw away all of my burnt orange clothing and all of our, everything we had from UT when we came down here in 2007, but um, eventually, I became the head of the accounting department here at Texas A&M about four years ago or so. And then um, in uh, 2022, they launched a national search for a new dean uh, for the business school. And, and I ended up being a part of that process. And eventually, in December of 2022, a little over a year ago, 15 months ago or so, I was announced as the new dean and i started in that role in february of last year so i'm only about 14 15 months into it but having the time of my life and i love texas a m love love may's business school love my colleagues here the students are remarkable it's i'm just i wake up every day and can't believe that i get to have this job it's an amazing experience <laughs> so do you kind of feel like you know you were made a stake president at your church and you're also made a stake president at your at your job or i mean isn't it a very more more of an administrative role as, as a dean or well i think the dean role is kind of you get to make it what you want it to be um it's funny you say that though i do have there's a number of members of the, there are a number of members of the church who are faculty members at mays or students at mays one of them is on the high council and he said, gosh, I can't get away from you no matter what I try to do. I, I have to put up with you at church and then I come to work and you're my dean and we laugh about that. But, um, you know, I'm still teaching. I love teaching. And so even as the dean, I teach a class still at Mays Business School. I'm involved in some of our executive education that we do as well. I love being in the classroom and I get to meet a lot with prospective students and their parents. I do recruiting events. What I found, you know, I've said enough about it, I'm sure already, but being a dean is really all about relationships, building relationships across this campus with other deans and other colleges and with the provost and the president. And then it's about building relationships with former students who love mm -hmm. the school and want to give back and want to help. And, and so that, that's the most rewarding and fulfilling part of the job is the relationships, including with students that you build as you try to serve people. That's kind of the, the purpose is to, is to elevate the school and serve people. And, and uh, that's one of our core values at Texas A&M is selfless service. Hmm. So I, you know, again, you, you can go like this or tell me to stop yeah, about A&M, no, but <laughs> You know, I was speaking with a, a member of the church, actually, who lives and works in Austin over the weekend, and we were talking about Texas A&M, and he said, Nate, how do more people not know about Texas A&M? It's just such a unique university in terms of not just the size, I mean, it's the largest university in America, but the history, the values. You know, when I came here as an applicant for a faculty job back in 2007, I stepped on campus for the first time. I'd lived in Austin for five years. I came down here and it was just a remarkable feeling like, what is this place? The way the students kind of carry themselves, they're, how polite they are. They're so respectful. They're, 
They're energetic. They say hi to everybody, except we say howdy on campus instead of hi. It's kind of one of our traditions. <laughs> so you're walking out, howdy, howdy, you know. And um, But we're built on these core values of respect, excellence, leadership, which you would love, loyalty, yep. integrity, and selfless service. We have an honor code, much like BYU does. Hmm. And those traditional values of just, you know, when you give someone your word, then you do it. And you're honest and you work hard and you, you know, you believe in being respectful of other people. Those core values have just created an environment here at Texas A&M that I think you cannot find on any other university campus in the country. And it's, in fact, the contrast is what stands out. It's not just that we're, you know, modestly different from the environment on other campuses. It's a remarkable difference. And, you know, I mentioned to some people, BYU has a devotional every Tuesday on campus at the basketball stadium, as you know, at the Marriott Center. Mm -hmm. Texas A&M has a worship service every Tuesday. It's in the evening rather than in the early afternoon like it is at BYU, but they get thousands of students who fill the basketball arena to come together and worship Jesus Christ. Wow. And it's a public university, but it's there's a very um well, we call it the Aggie spirit. It's going to sound kind of strange to <laughs> to you and others that don't know what, what it means because you haven't been here, but uh, there's a, a special feeling on campus and people here, tend, the students and others tend to be very devoted people religiously, no matter what their religion is. Mm -hmm. And even our football games, Kurt, we, Kyle Field is our famous football stadium, which was remodeled a few years ago. It holds about 110,000 people. When you, if you max it out, it can, it's, most games are 105,000 or so. It's a huge stadium. Every football game starts with an invocation. Wow. And I say, where is another public university in America where they still say a prayer at the beginning of a football game? But it's right here on Texas A&M campus. That's and cool. It's, it's really special. So um, d does your religion ever come up with uh, questions <laughs> come or they hear that you're quite involved in leadership in the church or... Yeah, that's been really one of the joys, honestly, of the last 14 or 15 months in this role. Um, I get asked about my religious faith all the time. And sometimes it comes from a, a place of, you know, worry or suspicion or, you know, kind of nervous about, well, who's this Latter-day Saint that's involved in leadership at Texas A&M now? But, but to be honest, at the same time, obviously, there have been decades of great Latter-day Saint faculty members at Texas A&M, including uh, many who have been in various leadership positions. And I think what you find in general is that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has a very great reputation in our area, in the Bryan College Station area and beyond. Um, there are a lot of members of the church in Texas, as you know. I mean, I think once you get outside of probably Utah, Idaho, Arizona, and probably California, but you know, gosh, yeah, I guess we probably don't have as many members of the church as California, but the church, Kurt, is so strong in Texas and it's growing at a very strong pace. And it's not just the transplants who are moving here. And there are a lot of those. We got, I mean, Californians are coming to Texas like crazy and and actually, they're coming from all over the country to Texas. It's a great place to live and work. But it's also the missionary work that's happening here. One of my favorite things during the time that I've served as state president, especially when we have our own state conference without a visiting authority, but often the visiting authorities ask for a recent convert to speak. But Kurt, if you could meet the young single adults who are joining the church on in our stake in Bryan College Station, I think you would be absolutely blown away by the just the quality of people who meet the missionaries or they have a friend who's a member of the church. And these are kids that have come from wonderful homes. 
They're students at Texas A&M. They're in, enrolled in these rigorous, amazing academic programs, and they meet the church at this time in their life, and it resonates with them, and they mm-hmm. join. And the stories they tell are incredible about how the Spirit moved on them and how they, their lives are changed by finding the gospel. And it's been an incredible thing to witness all of that growth in our state. Wow, that's awesome. Love to hear that. So, you know, you talk about this this rich culture at Texas A&M and the values and and how have you attempted to maybe stimulate a similar culture or, or a culture that's just as strong as a state president? Because uh, that's always tricky at times from from that uh, from that level yeah you know that's a great question um i think when from the very beginning of when we were called as a state presidency one thing that we felt really strongly was that in fact our very first state conference as a matter of fact which would have been in the spring of 2017 right after we were called and set apart in the fall of 2016. My topic for that state conference was, and even for our ward of branch conferences, actually, as a matter of fact. So actually, let me back up. It was ward, it was ward and branch conferences, not state conference. So gotcha. and we started doing those in January. By the way, when we were set apart, we had 17 units in our state. Oh, wow. 17 wards and branches. We They split our stake about six months later, and so it got a bit reduced. But anyway, the topic that spring that I spoke about was what I called the doctrine of belonging. And I hadn't really heard it called the doctrine of belonging per se, but although the church has emphasized creating a culture of belonging for mm-hmm. many, many years, in particular with young single adults and in institute and so forth, but throughout the church. And then here more recently now I've, I've, you know, there've been, there was a talk given in general conference pretty recently that was titled the doctrine of belonging. And so that was our vision too, that we wanted to create a stake that was a place where everyone who came to college station or the surrounding areas for whatever reason, whether they were with Texas A&M university or had nothing to do with the university whether they were lifelong Texans or a recent transplant, we wanted to say, you belong here. And it isn't just that we need you, we need you to fulfill a calling or we need you to help us grow and and create a great kind of piece of Zion here, but it was more about, we want you to be here too. It's not just, we need you, it's we want you here. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of been our, um, approach, you know, Kurt, to serving the stake for the last seven years has been that we love everyone. We include everybody. Um, we want people to feel when they, if they're here temporarily, even, you know, there's some parts of the church I, I hear from time to time where if you're a student there, then it's like the people who live there almost don't even want to try to start making a friendship because they it's hard to say goodbye every two years or every four years if they're or five if they're doing a PhD, whatever. And we've said from day one, we don't care if you're here for six months or one year or two years, whatever it is, we welcome you with open arms. We want a fellowship with you. We want to include you. We'll call you to serve in leadership callings, even if you think you might be moving in six months. We want everyone. And that has been, I think it's created a really, a really positive environment in the stake that people have responded very well to. Mm, that's awesome. Uh, th- I don't know if this is directly related, but it came to mind is just, uh, what is that? What is uh, your approach with, as far as mentoring the bishops that you work with and call and, and helping them, you know, establish their own culture and th- th- their own wards? What's that cadence like? Again, that, you know, for me, working with the bishops is really, I, th- I think, I don't know if I could quote chapter and verse in the handbook, but, <laughs> but I know I've been trained this way by area seventies and even general authority seventies who've come through. I think the stake president's perhaps single most important responsibility is to be a great steward of the bishops of the stake. You know, th- while they're mm-hmm. watching over the youth, and children in their stakes, or excuse me, in their wards. Um, 
And of course, I care about all the members from the children all the way up. But the relationship I have with the bishops is really important. And to support them and uh, be there for them, be accessible to them, visit with them frequently. I meet with them often, uh, counsel together with them about the not just the challenges they may be experiencing in their own wards and branches. In our case, we have some of both in our state, but also just their personal lives. How are things in their personal lives? And bishops are not without challenges. We had a bishop who was unemployed at the beginning part of this year. He uh, was actually employed by Texas A&M, but he was involved in the football program. And we had some turnover in the coaching and, and staff of the football program recently. If you have paid attention to the news, that's a whole nother story for another podcast. All right. <laughs> uh, but his job turned over and suddenly he was looking for work in our area. And so supporting them, the bishops of the stake and, and being there for them is important. And if I may, I'll just, you know, one thing we've, that I've really focused on with our bishops relates to, you know, sort of how they interact with and mentor and shepherd the youth of our stake. I think it's the undoubtedly the most important responsibility the bishops have. And it's also the most important trust that is placed in them by parents, uh, by the church itself, you know, to trust our bishops and their counselors to to be good mentors, great leaders, great counselors to the youth, and to help them in some cases through difficult things that they go through when they want to repent, for example, of, of things that have happened in their lives. And that's been a, a real strong emphasis in our in my mentoring with the state presidents that a bishop has an opportunity to demonstrate to the youth in, in his ward, for example, what, what I call hopeful repentance uh, looks like. And, you know, the great thing, Kurt, too, is I don't, I can't think of another church leader in my lifetime who has taught about repentance more powerfully, more regularly, more hopefully than President Nelson. Mm -hmm. And I feel so lucky and just blessed that my time as stake president overlaps almost, you know, very, very closely with when he has been president of the church and has taught so clearly about repentance that, for example, when a youth comes to a bishop with a heavy, you know, burden that, that they want help with, it's the responsibility of the bishop to help that youth or young single adult, or frankly, obviously it extends to all members, but in particular to the youth to help them feel hopeful and optimistic. And if repentance is joy, the way we've heard President Nelson and others talk about it, and the scriptures certainly testify of that, and the way the Savior personally ministered to people who needed to repent during his ministry, then we can model that for the youth. And I feel like it makes you know, one of the biggest impressions on them that they'll look back on later in their life when they think about their experience as a youth in the church, if they have a bishop who shepherds them through the repentance process in a hopeful, joyful, optimistic way, gives them hope for the future, helps them understand the role that the Savior plays in all of that, and removes the shame. You know, I, I think back to... I think in earlier generations, including in my youth, although I had wonderful bishops who approached things, I think, very sensitively and well and appropriately. Um, but I think, you know, in former times, shame was a lot more a part of kind of how youth felt when they came forward seeking help on the repentance process. They were sometimes made to feel like what they had done was was awful and, and terrible and and even and then they ended up feeling like, well, I guess that means I'm a bad person, you know, mm -hmm. if 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 I've done something bad and and we have the church has really, I believe, um, taught so clearly and so well in recent years 
largely thanks to the way the spirit has moved on President Nelson uh, that's allowed us to teach repentance in a very hopeful way that is amazing to watch. Yeah. I, I love that framing of, of repentance of not just repentance, but a hopeful repentance. Cause that's, I mean, it should be synonymous, right? Or that should be redundant, but yes. it's not, you know? Um, and so that's right. Uh, that, that's, that's just great. Are there, are there like specific like applications that you maybe would articulate with a new Bishop that you're serving with to, help them know how to do that. Cause sometimes it's like, that makes sense in the brain, but <laughs> the application or when I'm sitting in front of a youth or even an yeah. adult who's striving to repent, uh, how do I make that more hopeful? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a great question and there's a, a few things that come to mind for me. So, you know, I think one of the litmus tests that I talked with bishops about, you know, in terms of sort of gauging how well they're accomplishing that with someone who comes to them, seeking help with repentance. One litmus test is, you know, after your visit is over with them, let's say that you're in the office visiting for an hour, half hour, hour, whatever the time is. When that person gets up and leaves your office, do they feel significantly more hopeful than they felt when they walked in? Hmm. Have their burdens been made lighter? Now it's, it's, and I, and believe me, it isn't that the repentance process can completely finish in one visit. We all know that's <laughs> not the way it works. So it's not to say that the burden is gone, but the burden can be made lighter. And it's, it's even simple things like this. You know, a youth comes in, most of the youth who come in to repent to a bishop, frankly, are terrified of it. In many cases, it's even if they're close to their bishop, and sometimes being close to the bishop makes it more scary because they're afraid they're telling something to a priesthood leader and it might be the first time they've shared that with any adult you know we encourage them to be open with their parents in all of our, in every setting where we get the chance we encourage youth to share what's going on in their lives with their parents and notwithstanding that in many cases when they come to talk with the bishop it could be the first time that they're sharing what happened with someone else and I've framed it with the bishops that, you know, the youth are watching every bit of nonverbal communication when they're talking with you. They're looking for facial expressions, body language that's helping them process how they're being received, how their confession is being received. And often, Kurt, when I was in that role as a bishop and even as a stake president, when I deal with matters related to repentance, I will almost initially, the first words out of my mouth are, you know what? I am so proud of you for having the courage to come in here today and talk about this. I know it's not easy. I'm sure you stood outside that office door feeling a lot of trepidation and just worry about how it would go. And I want for a moment to just tell you, take a deep breath. It's all going to be okay. The hardest part is over coming forward like you've done. I'm so proud of you. And now I am going to be with you and I'm going to walk every step of the, the path of repentance with you that I can walk with you. Some of it you're going to have to do alone. And even that I'm going to shepherd you. I'm here for you. And when a youth hears, I am proud of you for coming today and starting this process. In many cases, the surprise on their face, it's like it's the last thing they expected to hear. And it's not, to be clear, I'm not telling the bishops to say, we're proud of them for what happened. Obviously that's, you know, we're working with them to, to change and repair what happened in, in some cases, but we're proud of them for taking that step. And I have taught the bishops to use that kind of language and to express love and admiration for the youth who come forward like that. And, um, you know, and then one last thing that comes to mind, I think traditionally in the church, priesthood leaders assign, you know, members who come in to work on repentance, they assign them things to read. It could mm -hmm. be a book, it could be conference talks, it could be chapters of scripture in the standard works. And even that we are very 
thoughtful and intentional and careful about what we assign. And there are general conference messages, for example, that are so uplifting and strengthening and they give hope, you know, on the topic of repentance. And there are verses of scripture and chapters of scripture that can be shared that do that. And then there are other materials that could be assigned, you know, many of them written, you know, I think decades ago in some cases that are a little bit more, I'll use the term heavy handed almost in Mm -hmm. the way they talk about the repentance process. And my feeling as the key holder for my stake has been that I don't, that's not the approach I want to take. And that's not the approach I think that really fits with the generation of youth and children and young single adults that we are nurturing in the gospel right now. And so we focus on sharing hope filled messages uh, with them. And that's another thing I've asked the bishops to, to be cognizant of. Yeah. I think that's a, I guess one of those things that maybe a stake president can assume is happening, but to be really direct about maybe some better resources, if, if you are going to ask them, you know, to read or ponder over something, some better resources that way. And, you know, one, I'll just highlight here the, and, you know, if you want more church or apostle sanctioned, uh, uh, books and the closer they are to modern day, the better. Like I'm just thinking the divine gift of forgiveness by elder Anderson, phenomenal resource that, uh, I'd be, I think every bishop should read it within his first two months, right. Of serving yes. and, and use that, the concepts in there are so refreshing. Um, and, and hope filled, you know? Yes. So, yeah. I love what you said about the closer we are to the current living, you know, the, the apostles and prophets who are serving right now today, I feel like the resources that they make available, their conference talks, the books that they've written, such as Elder Anderson's book that you mentioned, mm-hmm. um, I just feel like those are tremendous resources and they, they match the tone and, and the messaging that we're hearing in general conference now. Yeah. And so it's consistent with, with what the youth are hearing when they go to, when they watch general conference. And it just, I think it works really, really well that way. Yeah. Uh, tell me about uh, sacrament meetings in your stake. And as far as, you know, there's, I think, I, I know specifically in the Utah area, I'm sure in other areas, there's been this emphasis on having a Christ centered uh, sacrament meeting. And sometimes we can, we can miss the mark a little bit with the best intentions, but uh, I mean, yeah. how do you go about coaching your bishops on facilitating a Christ-centered sacrament meeting? That's something that we have worked really hard on uh, during the time that we've been serving, and it's something I feel like is just so critical to not just the experience that our members have when they come to sacrament meeting, but it's the individuals who are studying with the missionaries who come, some of them come into a sacrament meeting for their first time ever. And again, they're listening and looking for, you know, what is this church and what do they believe? And, you know, and by the way, the, um, the general conference leadership training resources that came out last October that are available through the gospel library. And we've been using those really uh, heavily with our, state council, our ward conferences, our bishops council that we hold. And, and, so and just forth. to clarify, these are resources in the gospel library. If you are a, a leader, right? They're not going to be in I, my gospel library. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I, you may be right about that. Although, um, when we go to ward conferences, we had one yesterday, mm-hmm. then during the second hour, we're actually having members pull out their devices and kind of follow along. And so I think there was a time when some of those resources were restricted based on your calling. And and I, maybe there's some of that still, but I'm guessing, I don't know if you have your gospel library there now, but Uh, if you, so if you click on handbooks, I think it's handbooks and callings, and then you look at um, leadership instruction, leadership instruction. That's exactly right. And then you go to general conference, um, so general conference leadership meeting, do you see that there? Uh-huh. And then and then October 2023 leadership instruction. Yeah, so when I go to that, I just see leadership instruction summaries. Do you see more than that? I see that. So I have that as well and then I have one more 
that might be a bit different that says stake and ward council materials. And those are the video clips. Oh, okay. So yeah, that I do not have, but okay. So that may be the difference. So the video clips are, I think virtually one-to-one with these summaries. So the summaries are like a PDF that you have access to. And then we have videos that we can use in training opportunities as well. And so the reason I brought that up is in the October general conference leadership training, they talked a lot about making sacrament meetings more Christ centered. Mm -hmm. That was a major theme. And then also making them more welcoming and more inviting. That was where they began talking about, for example, having greeters, greeters for your ward that are actually positioned at the outside doors so that when a member walks up from the parking lot or a visitor, then before they get to the first set of outside doors, you've got, and we're using the young women in our stake to do the greeting, which was encouraged by the leadership training Hmm. because I mean, who's got more sunshine and just smiles and what a, what a, what better group to welcome people to church than the young women of the church. Hmm. And so anyway, I wanted to acknowledge that there was tremendously helpful training from the general conference uh, materials. But for the last seven years, we have said to people and to the bishops in our stake that we want every sacrament meeting talk no matter what doctrine of the gospel it might be about, they all need to be connected explicitly to Jesus Christ. So let me give you an example of what we mean by that. Um, Take, for for example, I'll just pick two topics, family history and the law of tithing. Uh (laughs) They're both important doctrines. We teach them as missionaries to people who are, you know, finding out about the church for the first time. It's not that they are inappropriate topics for a sacrament meeting, but what the position we've taken is they are inappropriate for sacrament meeting if we don't connect them very directly to the Savior himself. So it cannot be someone's assigned to speak on the law of tithing, and we just leave it at that. It's got to be more along the lines of what we learn about Jesus Christ and his sacrifice through our obedience to the law of tithing, or perhaps something like how does obedience to the law of tithing draw us closer to Jesus Christ or for family history? It could be what does participation in family history work teach us about the great vicarious sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ through his atonement? You know, we're, we're making we're very careful to connect every sacrament meeting topic to the savior himself. And that's because we view sacrament meeting the same way it's talked about in general conference last October as a meeting that commemorates and recognizes and remembers the savior and his atoning sacrifice. We go there to make covenants at the sacrament table in commemoration of his atoning sacrifice and everything that happens in that meeting should be focused on him. And, uh, you know, there was a great talk. There was a talk given and okay. His name's Thomas Griffith. He gave a devotional talk at BYU back in 2006. So we're approaching 20 years ago and it was titled the very root of Christian doctrine. Well, and, I, and I'll insert here that uh, I interviewed him about six months ago about that talk. So people can- You're kidding. Oh, no. Okay. No. You know, okay. He, he got wow. into detail about the whole the whole approach of, of doing that in a stake. And so people should yes. listen to the talk and then also we'll link to that, that episode as well. Okay. That's amazing. Well, I came across that talk when I was a bishop, actually. I read it, I'd read it before then, but we used mm-hmm. that when I was a bishop and we've used it now in our stake. We've tried to take the same approach that uh, President Griffith took when he was a state president, which is to say that sacrament meetings should be Christ-centered, period. There, sh- you know, there should be no doubt in the mind of any visitor who walks into one of our meetings that Jesus Christ is, the, is whom we worship, that that meeting is devoted to him, that we are bearing witness of him, we're testifying of him and his atoning sacrifice. And it there's a power in it. 
And, you know, Elder Holland said once, or President Holland said once in one of his talks, I forget which one off the top of my head right now, but he said, if we continue to hand out stones when people ask for bread, they will eventually stop coming to the bakery. <laughs> and <laughs> so to true. me, it was such a profound analogy that people come to sacrament meeting wanting to feel connected to Jesus Christ. They want to make covenants with him through the ordinance of the sacrament, and they want to hear about him. I mean, it's back to second Nephi. We talk of Christ. We rejoice in Christ. We preach of Christ. We prophesy of Christ. And that should characterize every sacrament meeting in the church. And to the extent that we've done that, and we've tried to do that here, we consistently hear Kurt from members who come here for a period and, and then move on or are here for a long time, they say, man, these the sacrament meetings in this stake are just powerful because they hear about the Savior and hear mm. testimonies of him. Yeah, often as I think about that, and I love the analogy of President Holland offers of, of the individuals want to be fed, they don't want to be weighed down, right? And so often yes. with the best intentions, and it seems like in my experience, I hear it more at state conference than anywhere else of just this feeling of this message of we've got to do better, right? And you've got to do better. I've got to do better. And we don't realize that Christ did enough. Like that message is redemptive. And that feeds yes. me. That le helps me leave the building feeling redeemed, not thinking, not weighed down or thinking I'm not, I'm not measuring up. What am I, you know, kind of beat myself up as I walk out into the parking lot. That's right. And, you know, if I may, in my mind, one of the most powerful demonstrations of what you just shared about just feeling your burdens lifted, feeling redeemed, having a redemptive message. You know, I, this insight came to me a few years ago. I was substitute teaching in seminary when we were doing Doctrine and Covenants. And I just want to mention briefly about section 45 of Doctrine and Covenants. Um, I believe it's one of the most powerful messages about the Savior in all the standard works. And I guess what struck me when I was preparing for this seminary lesson at that time is like 4.30 in the morning, trying to get ready for a early morning seminary lesson. I'm <laughs> juggling my stake president calling and substituting in seminary fairly frequently that semester. But this is the only example I know of, Kurt, in all of the standard works where Jesus actually steps into a role play for us. He, he demonstrates a role play as a teaching technique. And it's funny, when I was a missionary in South Korea, you know, more than 25 years ago, uh, we did role plays all the time. We'd go to zone conference and the mission president would, you know, pick randomly, pick on a couple of us out of the audience and say, hey, they're going to, these elders are going to come up and they're going to role play teaching, you know, discussion four or whatever. And you would get into character and you do a role play and role plays are used a lot in the church because they're effective and they work. And Jesus actually does a role play here in section 45 verses three through five. I'm going to read that if, 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 if yeah, that's please. okay with you. Yeah. And before I do that, let me just say, this is, these verses are well known in the sense that Jesus is going to describe his role as our advocate. And of all the titles of the savior, and he has so many of them and they're all so meaningful. His title as our advocate with the father is such a powerful title. And it's such a, an encouraging and hopeful title to know that he advocates for us. And when I have thought, you know, kind of in my normal life, Kurt, about what it means to be an advocate, it's interesting because the example I've given, I've got a son who is 12 years old and he really wants to play football in middle school next year. Oh, wow. We've never allowed our boys to play football, even though football is like a religion in Texas. <laughs> yeah, don't mention that around uh, the office, you know. <laughs> I know. I think I'd be run out of my office and probably run out of the state if I admitted that we don't let our boys play football. But suddenly, you know, he's the youngest in the family and he wants it so badly and he's been begging us to let him play football. But I was thinking, you know, the problem, one challenge he would have is if he tried out for the middle school football team, because we have not let him play football so far in his life, 
he's going to struggle to make the team anyway, even if we did change our minds. And I thought, you know, I guess what if I went to the coach and advocated for my son? If I became his advocate, I could go to him and say, listen, coach, I know that Austin, my son Austin, has not played football for several years like the rest of these kids trying out. And he's kind of new to the sport. But gosh, let me tell you about him. He's got so much grit. He's got a lot of athleticism. Um, I've thrown some footballs to him in the backyard, and I've watched him make some great catches. And he's got a positive attitude. And I could list all these things about my son in my attempt to be his advocate and try to help him get on the football team. And that's the way I kind of think about what it means to be an advocate. And then you read this role play that the Savior gives us in section 45. And he completely turns my impression of what it means to be an advocate on its head because it's totally different. And here's what he says in verse, starting in verse three, he says, listen to him who is the advocate with the father who is pleading your cause before him. And now he steps into this role play moment. Verse four saying, father, behold the sufferings and death of him who did no sin in whom thou wast well pleased. Behold the blood of thy son, which was shed, the blood of him whom thou gavest, that thyself might be glorified. Wherefore, Father, spare these, my brethren, that believe on my name, that they may come unto me and have everlasting life. So, Kurt, he doesn't go before the Father and advocate for us on the basis of all the things I've done to deserve eternal life. Mm. He advocates for us in front of the Father on the basis of what he did for us. It was yeah, wow. his sufferings and death. It was his blood that was shed. And because of that, he can be our advocate. And when I figured that out, that he's never going to stand before the father and say, look at what Nate Sharp did during his life. It's not going to be that. And because I know that his, and he, he even says he's pleading your cause. Well, guess what? Our cause is the cause of Jesus Christ. And the fact that he paid for our sins and he's already answered the ends of the law on our behalf that's our greatest case that he can plead before the father. And it changes everything, Kurt, about what we believe about our relationship with Jesus Christ, what it means for him to be our advocate and what our relationship with the father is like. And it's, I just think it's so powerful and so uh, instructive. What an insight. I really appreciate you sharing that. That's so, so true. Cause, um, and like you said, we get that mixed up, like maybe someday Christ will prove to the father why we deserve to get in, but he, he's already proven it through who he is. And uh, that's, exactly that's, awesome. It. that's awesome. And, and now that's you exactly can go to your son's football coach and describe Patrick Mahomes and why he, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's that's the same right. idea, but a little different. Uh, <laughs> yes. Really good. Well, as we, before we wrap up here, I want to make sure we hit on this concept of eliminating the transactional view of our relationship with, with Jesus Christ. And I think you've touched on some of these things, but um, I mean, what, what more can you teach us about just, because it's easy for us humans and mortals to get in this transactional relationship with all things in life, it seems. Yeah, it's so true. And it's funny how, like you said, just how naturally and how easily we let our understanding of, of God and of our relationship with him and of the Savior and that relationship kind of just devolve into a transactional relationship. Um I've loved the analogy that's been shared recently by one of the apostles. I think it was Elder Christofferson, but hopefully you can edit that if I got the wrong apostle who <laughs> talked about the talked about the heavenly vending machine. You know, oh, yeah. That, yeah, I think it was him. Uh -huh. I believe it was Elder Christofferson that um, you know, it's it's not as if God is, you know, up in heaven just waiting for us to put a quarter in the machine and for every quarter we put in then a blessing pops out. You know, that's a very transactional view, but it's amazing to me how many of our members, and maybe it starts in youth and, and I don't know where it all originates, but they have sort of that transactional view. Part of it, I think, 
may relate to that, those wonderful verses in section 130 of the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, which I'll quote, and I'm so grateful that I was there at Brigham Young University when Elder Maxwell uh, gave a fireside when I was a student there. And the title of the fireside was just Insights from My Life. It was, you know, getting a little bit toward the, the latter part of Elder Maxwell's life, of course. But in that fireside, he shared these verses. So I have kind of two scriptures I want to use, if I may, to illustrate how we can overcome this transactional view. The first one, then, coming back to 130, this is section 130, verses 20 and 21. And it says, There is a law irrevocably decreed in heaven before the foundations of this world, upon which all blessings are predicated. And when we obtain any blessing from God, it is by obedience to that law upon which it is predicated. And, you know, if you take that, those two verses kind of at, at a sort of superficial interpretation, then in a sense, I guess you could misinterpret them as describing a transactional relationship with the blessings of heaven. And in his devotional speech at BYU, Elder Maxwell said, you know, if you've kind of puzzled over those verses the way I have in my life, the only answer I can give you is that it must be the case that the ratio of the Lord's blessings to our relatively minuscule obedience is a very, very generous ratio indeed. Indeed, Meaning that, yes, of course the, that scripture is true, it's doctrine, that the blessings of heaven are predicated upon our, obedient, our obedience, but that does not mean it's a one-to-one -one relationship. And we offer, you know, in that talk, he said, the Lord is so anxious to bless us, so eager to, to be merciful and, and, to, and to bless us. And so that idea of a generous ratio of blessings to our obedience, I think, is so critical. Um, another thing I'll mention, one last scripture that I think is, is also really important, because sometimes, Kurt, I think we end up feeling like we have almost a transactional relationship, even with the Holy Scriptures. And so, for example, this year we're studying the Book of Mormon. And everyone I know in the, in our stake, at least is so excited about that. I mean, who doesn't love the book of Mormon among yeah. the standard works? It's just such a joy to study and it's so powerful and, and everyone loves the, the stories and the testimonies that are there. And I think the risk is that if we're not careful, we forget what the scriptures were given to us for in the first place, like why the Lord gave them to us. And the reality is there's sort of a means to an end. Like the Book of Mormon's not the end. The Book of Mormon is a means to an end. It's meant to help draw us to Jesus Christ and to help us increase our faith in him and come unto him and all those things. And there are these beautiful verses in the New Testament in John chapter 5 where the Lord Jesus Christ actually, actually rebukes some of his followers and what's amazing to me, Kurt, is these verses, one of them in particular, is often misquoted and misused in our church, in part because the King James Version of the Bible actually mistranslated one of the verses in, in a pretty important way. It's missing one word, but that one word changes the whole meaning of the verse. And so this is John chapter 5, verses 38 through 40, just three verses. But again, it, it gets to the heart of what are the scriptures for and how do we remember their ultimate purpose when we're interacting with them so that we can get away from this idea of almost this transactional, oh, I checked a box today. I read my 25 minutes in the Book of Mormon. I'm done. I can move on. And I love the rebuke the Savior gives. So I'll quote verse 38 first, and then I'll say a quick thing about 39. It says in 38, And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. Then verse 39 starts with search the scriptures. And it sounds like a commandment. 
And that's the way the church uses this verse in about every general general conference talk I've ever read that quotes John 5, 39. They quote it as saying, search the scriptures. When in reality, Jesus is actually making the opposite point. And what it's supposed to say, if you read other translations, the word ye is supposed to be at the beginning or you. And so let me read it that way. And then you, you'll see how these verses blend together. It should say, you search the scriptures for in them, ye think ye have eternal life and they are they which testify of me and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. And so when you add all that together, those three verses, what he's saying to his followers is you spend all your time searching the scriptures because you think you can get eternal life from a book. And yet you don't even recognize that I'm the person those very scriptures have been pointing you toward from the beginning of the Old Testament up until New Testament times. Those words, those prophets who wrote were testifying of Jesus and his own followers missed that in the scriptures. And that's why he said, you don't have my word in you because you won't accept me as the one the scriptures testify of. So my point is, it's not about the book. It was never about the book. It's not about the Bible. It's not about the Doctrine and Covenants. It's not about the Book of Mormon or the Pearl of Great Price. And it's not about checking a box and having a transactional relationship with the scriptures either. Those scriptures, and this year in particular, the Book of Mormon, they were given to us as an instrument to bring our souls to Jesus Christ. There's a power in the written word to lead us to Jesus Christ. And if we stop at the book and we don't fill our souls and our lives with his word and let those books change us, change who we are, change how we treat other people, help us develop Christ-like attributes, all those wonderful things the scriptures can do. That's not transactional. That's transformational. That's the scriptures leading you to the savior because he's the one that it's all about. And so those are a few of the things that, that yeah. you know, we've taught and emphasized in terms of um, eliminating a transactional view of our relationship with God or with the scriptures and focusing on developing a love for the savior and for heavenly father and uh letting that be the guiding force in our lives love it now uh nate i want to highlight something now i'm just freestyling here but i think i yeah. like an insight that came to mind as you were taking us on that journey Please. which i think emphasizes your point going back to dr Cummins, well for you to put this up against dr Cummins 45 and then taking us to dr Cummins 130 so in verse 21, and when you obtain any blessing, so, and when we obtain any blessing from God, mm -hmm. it is by obedience. It never says it is by our obedience, mm. but Jesus fulfilled, he was obedient to the law upon which it was predicated. It is through our wow. relationship with him, just like it talked about in 45, it's his yes. works that did it, right? Yes. It's his obedience yes. because I, yes. I, oftentimes... I've received incredible blessings and I have to think, what did I do? Like what, what law in heaven yes. that this was predicated? And oftentimes I can't yes. think of one, right? Or yes. I get a blessing and I'm like, I, I think there was a, a paper filing error somewhere because I don't think I was supposed to get this blessing, right? But it is it never yes. says our obedience. It's just obedience to the law, which Jesus Christ fulfilled. So I don't know, something to think about. I think it's an amazing insight. I love yeah. that insight. And it's consistent with Elder Maxwell again saying, yeah. if you've puzzled about why you were blessed when you don't feel like you deserve it, you know, I, I think you're, I think that's a wonderful, powerful insight. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Nate, this has been such a fantastic discussion. And uh, maybe let's do it again before 2032. Huh? What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I would love it.
it's been That's an cool. honor. Thank you for, for having me on. I appreciate it, Kurt, very yeah. much. And well, thanks for all you're doing with the podcast. Sure. No, it's a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Um, the last question, I don't even know if I asked you this, you know, eight years ago or whatever, but as you reflect on your time as a leader, how has being a leader helped you become a better follower of Jesus Christ? You know, I think one of the most sacred things about the experiences that you have as a leader in the church is just getting that, I hope it doesn't sound like a cliche, but that front row seat to observe the way a relationship with Jesus Christ and just the power of Jesus Christ to change people's lives. And, you know, I will remember for the rest of my life experiences I've had as a stake president where I've watched the Savior's power to heal people and to forgive people and to bring you know, so many of his miracles in the scriptures were bringing, bringing, he even brought people who had died back to life. And in my ministry and leadership in the church, I have seen him bring back to life uh, people's testimonies, for example, where I thought that the light has gone out, like the flame is out, the candle's not even there anymore. It's gone. The belief and the faith are gone. And yet, the Savior has the power to bring it back to life. And so to be able to watch him bless people and heal people and change people's lives has been the most humbling thing to see and one of the greatest blessings that has taught me about the importance of following Jesus in my own life and trusting him for all of the healing and blessings and everything that I need in my life. It's been amazing to watch.